closest possible relationship with Jesus, to hear his voice, to know his love and his peace and his power in your life. Yes. 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 Anybody not want it? <laughs> no, if you're a visitor, you wonder what's going on. But you're very welcome, we certainly don't expect you to participate in, in financially, but um, uh, you are so welcome. So, um, yeah, genuinely, we, we have a number of, um, sort of members that we share in common. We particularly, as fellow labourers in the finest vineyard in the British Isles, which is, of course, Yule, because we are Yule East at Howell Hill. As fellow labourers, you know, we really, it means a lot to see this place continue to flourish. You had uh, a wonderful minister in Sue who built the whole place up. And I cannot tell you how much God has blessed you in, uh, in John. Um, I'm so looking forward to serving with you, John, and to getting to know you better and better. But I already know that you have an amazing heart for Jesus, incredible personal warmth, and the capacity, with your help, in every way, and the emphasis is on the every today, to do an amazing thing in this place. Amazing. And today is about how we all get around you and Karen and the wardens and the PCC to do amazing stuff. So are we in favour of amazing stuff? Yes. yes. This is brilliant. We're on a steady upward curve here. <coughs> and, uh, Yes, so, we were, we're going to look at money. Who was really excited when they heard how they came to talk about money? <laughs> Do you know, I, uh, I go to some churches and they say, oh, um, somebody mentioned money. In 1973. <laughs> Didn't go down well. <laughs> and they've got lots of funny feelings about this. I remember when I was first ordained, another minister said to me, Oh, you know, you've got this stock of goodwill, and whenever you mention money, it goes down a bit. And so I made a mental thought never talk about money. And certainly never become an artist and steward supervisor. <laughs> and I've slightly mucked up on uh, on both of those. But you know, God has filled me with an extraordinary passion for this. What I've realised now is something that is really central. <laughs> because at the very heart, it doesn't let me have all the fun stuff. All the fun stuff, then doing something that, oh dear, we've got to go and pay for it. A kind of duty and a weariness about the whole thing. Now I've come to realise that at the very heart of the Christian faith, there is the most extraordinary act of generosity. Because God himself decided to come and be with us. He gave a gift of himself in Christ to be born as a vulnerable child, to, uh, to teach us, to be with us, to die in our place on the cross and to rise. He is risen to rise in this Easter season, to rise, conquering death and opening the gates of heaven that we can be welcomed by our loving Heavenly Father, dressed not in the rubbish of our own mistakes, but in the beautiful righteousness of Christ that he gives to us. It's just amazing. And we have a God that we cannot outgive. <coughs> My central message to you this morning is that God loves pouring, pouring his resources into his people and into his church in order that he can pour them out. And generosity is at the very centre of our and uh, I look, my prayer for this place is that we are going to see great miracles with money, because that is what his word promises. And that 
experience, we grow in faith. This Bible is real. This God is real. We can rely on his promises. Amazing stuff happens. So, you've had John for a while now, so I need to put you through a test um, to, uh, to see how well he's teaching you. Um, how many verses in the Bible are on money, wealth, and possessions? Okay. Do we have an infinite bit? It's quite a big book. 66 books, actually. How many verses? 50. Right, any advance on 50? On 50. Oh, any advance? 500. 500. Going at 500, going once, going twice, anything on 500? Well, okay, we'll come back to that. Now then, supposing we took here, if here we talked about money and wealth and possessions as often as Jesus did, how often would we be talking about those things? Would it be like once every 50? Would it be once every 10 years? Would it be once every 50 Sundays? Would it be once a year? Would it be twice a year? How often? How much of Jesus' teaching was about money? Once a year. Once a year. That's a good one. <coughs> we'll put up with this once a year. We'll diarise our holidays for, um, for giving a Sunday. Yes. Okay, let's look at the answers. 2,300 verses. And Jesus talked about money, wealth, and possessions a third of the time. A third of the time. So,
deep down I look in my own heart and there are times we say to Jesus, come into my life and you can stand, you can sit over there, but don't touch my money, don't touch my career plans, which are very impressive but yet to be realised, don't touch my career plans, and, and, but you bless my plans, hear my plans, you can bless those, uh, but I'll come to you if there's a problem. Don't we? We have Jackie Pulliger here recently. I can't remember whether you guys came, but uh, I asked her, she said, yeah, I think you could just admit in suburbia and come to church once a week. And she said, being half a Christian is a miserable thing. Uh, there is, like my dear mother, God bless her, here. She said one day, David, I hope when you get older that you marry a nice Christian girl. But not too Christian. <laughs> There is Surrey moderation. Let's be careful about all this. We can't really trust the promises of God. But actually, we really can. That's the amazing news that I want us to focus on and look at briefly this morning. Well, it's never briefly with me, but there we are. This is about freedom. It's about breaking free. All this anxiety, all this you have come to want, ooh, I've got to hang on to this. And I love that passage. I didn't actually liaise on the choice of scripture, but if I had been asked to choose one, I would have gone for 2 Corinthians 9, 6, whatever it was. It is just perfect. Because Paul, he's a people in Corinth, <coughs> Corinth well, they're a bit thick. And uh, Paul explains really clearly how it works. And um, uh, I'll come back to that actually. It is really clearly how it works. He says this. He says, remember, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows sparingly, I can afford three seeds for God, not for me. I've got one here, I've got one here, and one here. And um, they might grow. For I call the shriveled life, whoever sows sparingly, <coughs> and meanly, and cautiously, will also reap. Not very much. But, sorry, whoever sows Purpose and peace and fruit that we may 
this, this has always been an outward looking church. That's why I love this place so much. Fruit, that through us, your generosity will, you will, will result in thanksgiving to God. So there's a promise there. That God will stand by us when we give generously. And you know, you talk to those who have been Christians for years and they will tell you, you can't outgive God. Whatever we put in, he, you know, God is no man's debtor. He pours resources in. Through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. In other words, you'll be known for this. People will say, throughout this area, increasingly, where there is a need, all saints is out there. They don't sit there and walk up, what's the cost, or whatever. Just pour yourselves out there in every way. Whatever the needs of this community, all saints is there first. And the history of the Christian church shows that when we pour ourselves out, then, in faith, when we pour ourselves out, when we give generously, in every way, of all that we are, then God pours his resources back in. We pour out. He pours in more than we could ever imagine. And that has been the... Now, clearly, if you think, well, you know, ha, 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 uh, uh, equities are a bit flat at the moment, and... Uh, Fixed interest, fixed interest security is not quite sure where they're going. I'll put money into God because I'll get a good return. I've got this theory that God's quite bright and he'll probably see through that one. But if we come to him in a sense of joyful, thankful, rejoicing, cheerfulness, then the results are very different. And that is the experience of the Christian communities for two millennia. Um, Billy and Ruth Graham said, We have found in our own home, as have thousands of others, that God's blessing upon the nine tenths, the nine tenths when we tithe, helps it to go further than ten tenths used to go without his blessing. And uh, certainly in our own church, we sort of teach, uh, where possible, people to grow towards that tenth of our net income after income tax and national insurance. And uh, it's, you know, it's, it, it's a journey. It's a journey. And I'm talking about steps today towards that. But that was uh, certainly what, uh, what, what Billy and Ruth Graham found and what uh, you know, all those I deal with who, who follow, follow this are finding. Uh, John Wimber, who was an amazing leader who was used to spark what we call the, you know, the Holy Spirit revival of the Church of England when he came to originally to Brompton. He said this, <clears throat> in my long experience of Christian ministry, God releases money to those he can trust to invest it in the kingdom. So, can he trust us? Can he trust us? Can he trust you? Can he trusts me. That is the uh, amazing challenge of Scripture. And my message and my encouragement is to trust and try. Trust the express promises of God and try giving at a level that you never thought possible. Amaze yourselves. Amaze John, I want to see John's amazed face, really. I'm just looking forward to that. <laughs> it's important in practical terms, of course, because um, we are very different in this diocese to elsewhere. In some parts of the country, one vicar looks after 20 parishes. Whereas here, in Ewell, we've got three vicars looking after Ewell alone. And it's my job to keep it that way. At the moment, um, uh, you know, outgoings here are much higher than ingoings, and uh, we need to turn that around. We need to turn that around because God's got an amazing job. But I want to go far beyond that. I was saying to John this before the I said, look, look, what would you do 
If you didn't have to worry about money all the time, what would you do? You see, I get amazed when you think of how much this church does. Particularly the focus on children who bubble and squeak and whatever it's called. <laughs> you know, it's amazing what you do. And yet you just, you have a vicar and you have an amazing administrator in Karen. But that's it. No youth minister. No children's minister. No families minister. Having to worry about every single activity, every single brick and whatever. Yes, you've got people who give time generously for all those things. But to build and lead those things, to build in faith the size of structure that is needed to really grow. That will take a big step. And that is what we're, we're praying for here. West Yule is an enormous parish. And it brings in hugely diverse areas. Our parish is very small in Howell Hill. And they're all four bed detached <coughs> houses. People say, I've got you know, cash flow forecast till I'm 105. Why do I need Jesus? I say, what happens when you're 106? Um, but, you know, uh, here, particularly the bits of Longmead you've got, you have a lot of people who are broken, who are struggling, and who really, really need Jesus. And in every church, my challenge is always, do you see church as being a little club here? Or do you yearn to be the real parish church? reaching out to all, whatever it is, 12,000 people, and seeing this place, it's been such growth, such success, do you yearn to see this place filled? Filled to overflowing, with pattering tiny feet, and older people's feet, and all sorts of feet, noise and joy at what God is doing. Because that is the call. As your incumbent, John has what we call the cure of souls. He is responsible to Almighty God for the spiritual welfare of everybody who lives in the West York Parish. And why I love this place, and I really mean that, is because under Sue and under John, I know the heart is for the people out there. And we, when we do this miracle of generosity, we will have the resources not just to keep going, but to keep growing. Not just to keep going, but to keep growing. <coughs> that is the exciting opportunity. So try. And uh, when you fill your form in this week, at the end of the day, you know, it's not a contract enforceable at law, but just say, I'm going to try giving at a level I never thought possible, and I'm going to see what happens. And then if I'm invited, I'm going to come back, and we'll just see what happens. But I've done this at lots of other places. Typically, we've seen increases in annual giving of up to 35%. We actually must make sure it's at least 20 here. You know, and I've never had people say, oh, I really regret that. There's just joy and amazement at what is happening. So, trust and try. Trust and try giving at a level that you never thought possible. Because that's the way we grow faith. So you will see God's faithfulness and then you will, you know, have that next great step in knowing his presence and power in the world. Just like Paul said, you know, oh, you know, you start with milk and then you go on to beef burgers or whatever. We keep growing. Who wants to keep growing? Yes. yes. Do you know, some of the older people who want to keep growing the most, isn't that so healthy and so wonderful? Two final points. Kittens are dangerous. <coughs> Why are kittens dangerous? We've got two. Um, I went to, or I heard of one parish in another diocese. was a lovely old lady who'd been so faithful at the 8 a.m. communion, or the 8.45 a.m. communion, to which I came this morning. No, it is um, amazing. And she went to be with Jesus. She's always an amazing 
we promise it will be more amazing than we can ever imagine. And she miraculously she left her house to the Cats Protection League. And uh, now nothing against kittens, because we've got some at home, rat dogs, they're gorgeous. But there are countless millions of people who will give in support of small furry animals and large furry animals and everything else. But it is over Christian organisations depend upon Christian givers. And the Church of God depends on the Christian family. It depends on us. So focus your giving on the church. Now, um, the Church of England kind of goes, oh well, you know, give 5% to the church, 5% to Gordon Ethics for the church, and 5% to other Christian causes. I think here, certainly my wife and I uh, give our tithe entirely to how will, because then we can use money together, we can decide to give to other things as a church. So my encouragement is, particularly <coughs> given the situation that we're facing here, focus everything that you can on the church. Uh, doing two things. Oh, I've got two particular requests. If um, you don't give regularly at the moment through your bank account, please take that step this week. At whatever level you feel able to do, take that step. Because, um, you know, if you went for a job and you, they said, well, we can't actually pay you a salary, but we'll have a collection every now and again, uh, you wouldn't go for it, would you, really? You know, we, we need this team to focus on the on growing kingdom of God. We need to know what's coming in each month to be confident. So, everybody, please, if you can see yourself a, part, a core part of the family here, please, at whatever level you can, make sure that you're part of the regular giving through your bank account. Secondly, if you already give, thank you for, for your bank account, thank you for what you're doing. But it is, um, it's time for the next step. And uh, I want to commend those, um, those stepping stones to you. I'm not saying if it's new to you, you suddenly go all the way. But I would say keep moving. Keep moving. It may well be that you've been giving the same amount for ages. It may be that when you go home and you work out what it is as a proportion of your net income, it's only one or two percent, really. And uh, in response to the overwhelming one, amazing promises to us that we've been looking at today. So take the next step. And if actually it's not that much at the moment, not that much plus two or three or four percent is still not that much. I've got a wife who's an accountant to talk to these things. Okay. <coughs> so it may need to be quite a big step. It may need to be going up by two or three times. But you know, God will stand with you in that. And it is needed. Take the next step. Keep moving and see what God does. And when you um, <laughs> take your last step, it will be amazing. St. Paul says, you know, no mind has imagined, no eye has seen um, what God has prepared for those who love him. It will be utterly, utterly amazing. It's always really hard, really hard for those left. But life is a long race. Who wants to think, and who wants to be eternal here, but it's going to be even more amazing when we're eternal in heaven. Who wants to finish his life well, to be remembered well, to have an impact long after we go? I always think the mark of a good life is a good funeral, a massive Thanksgiving service, with people, I do get lots of these, and people say these amazing things about people, it makes me feel so inadequate afterwards. You know, you know, you know, oh, they were amazing dads, they were amazing this, you know, oh God, you know, more amazingness. Yeah, but we want that smile like back, don't we? We want to be remembered well, to finish well. And uh, uh, as part of that, do make sure, if you've yet to do this, that somewhere in your will, A, you have a will, because that's part of loving your family and organising stuff properly, but make sure that there's something to keep the work of God going through the church. Not least since um, the tax relief is really substantial. And it's really, really easy. Happy to talk to you about that over coffee. 
and he's well as well. So, may I pray for you and may I encourage you. Firstly, let's make sure that we encourage John by saying every form filled in, whatever you can do or not do, everybody into, into the regular giving scheme. And let's all take the biggest step. So I'm not going to go any further. If I fall off that step, I'm going to get nibbled by a trap or whatever. But, you know, take that next step and you will see God's faithfulness in abundance in this place. Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you so much for the work that you have started and which is continuing to grow in this amazing church of yours. Lord, uh, come Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, I pray. And uh, I pray for the gift of faith. The gift of faith to be released afresh in this place. The faith to stand upon your word, to trust your word, and to take the next step. We pray, Lord, for the gift of giving, the grace, of giving. We thank you for your overwhelming generosity to us in Jesus Christ. And we pray that you'll help us to give recklessly and joyfully and in faith that we may see you do miracles in this place. Miracles in every way. And Lord, I pray that you will stand by every, uh, every family, every person present who decided in, in taking this step. Pray your financial protection. Pray that you will affirm and, uh, and really show your, your love and faithfulness. Help us to pour ourselves out in your service with all that we have and, um, and to know the joy of standing in that endless river of love and grace and provision which flows from you and pouring it out into this community. Your name may be lifted high, and we may see 